Thank you, Richard, and um, thank you to all of you for turning up uh, this sunny lunchtime. Um, I shall talk at a cracking pace so that I hope we have time for questions um, at the end. And what I'm going to address is uh, behaviour change and um, talking about what I'm uh, calling three pillars of hearts, minds and environment, which are all key to this issue. Uh, but just to begin with a little bit about me, I'm a director of the Health Psychology Research Group here, and we develop methods for understanding behaviour, helping people to change their behaviour, um, preventing ill health, managing illness, and also in terms of delivering high quality services. As Richard said, I'm also director of UCL's Centre for Behaviour Change, and this brings different academic disciplines together on the basis that no one discipline has got all the answers to uh, behaviour change. And also, uh, very importantly, seeks to translate that academic expertise to the world out there who could make use of it, whether it's policymakers, practitioners, commercial sector, and indeed um, the general public. So do go on the website um, if you're of interest. And in February, we've got uh, a conference, the second one on digital health and well-being. Uh, we're also launching a very interesting book, Thinking About Behaviour Change, an interdisciplinary dialogue, uh, which is being launched here on November the 11th. So um, do come along to either of those if you're interested. OK, so why is behaviour important? It's key to nearly everything, and here's some areas. A productive economy, satisfying relationships at work and home, being the kind of person we want to be, a sustainable environment, safe environment, happy and well-functioning society, good health and well-being. So behaviour in every single area of our life, whether it's workplaces, neighbourhoods, homes, indeed in politics. And why an emphasis on behaviour change? Well, I'm just going to show you a few um, newspaper headlines from recent weeks. Um, the future of the world actually depends on our behaviour in many different ways, to do with energy, conservation, recycling, etc. Um, we have a big refugee crisis and a migration crisis, and this is being done because of a whole range of behaviours. Uh, conflict and war, many people dying. We have a huge range of health problems. Obesity, epidemic, thousands of people losing their lives every year because of smoking, uh, skin cancer, the list is long. And um, the threat hanging over us of um, not only all the infections that we're aware of, um, but also in this country, the threat of pandemic flu is one of the uh, top threats that have been identified. And the extent to which that happens when it does happen, it transmits and is harmful, will very much depend on a whole host of people's behaviour. So, uh, just to give one example from a, a research study, 20,000 women and men, uh, 45 to 7 years, no known cardiovascular disease or cancer, this was in the UK. Those who smoked or didn't um, follow guidelines in terms of being physically active, uh, eating fruit and vegetables and not drinking excessive alcohol, uh, were four times my, more likely to have died at follow-up 11 years later. So. OK, why do we do things that are against our interest and are not good for us? Key question. Um, one of the issues is we may be aware of how we want to change behaviour, but behaviour change is not easy. Um, we have a science of behaviour change, but very few people apply it. Why is that? Um, one of the reasons, I think, is um, we know, or at least I know, I can't build bridges, I can't perform open heart surgery, but we all behave and we see other people behave and we have our own theories about how to change behaviour, whether it's children, pets, colleagues. Uh, fine, the trouble is these theories can be wrong. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what I'm calling the heart, which actually isn't the heart, it's the evolutionary old bit of our brain, um, the mind, the more reflective uh, advanced bit of our brain and also uh, the environment, which is key to behaviour change. And if you look along these pictures at the bottom, you see people standing on an escalator going up the gym. Uh, weird. <laughs> the usual array of sweets as you um, go past the checkout. 
and uh, people trying to walk with the only uh, possible uh, way of walking along a busy road. So in order to understand behaviour, one absolutely has to understand it in the particular context. It doesn't happen outside of a context. Um, and the key questions are why are they as they are, but also what needs to change for the desired behaviours to occur. It might be helpful for this lecture for you all to think about some behaviour in your own lives that you might like to change. Why is that behaviour as it is? What would need to happen for it to change? Now, to answer that question, um, myself and colleagues have developed a model of behaviour which we call COMBI. And I'm going to give you a little thought experiment uh, for probably about 30 seconds. And that is, for behaviour to change, what three conditions need to exist? Think of the behaviour in your own life that you may have identified. What needs to be there for that behaviour to change? Now, a clue is... One of them begins with C, one with O, one with N, hence combi. Okay? If you haven't got there, um, think about the uh, US jurisprudence system. Uh, in order to prove that somebody's committed a crime, you need to prove that three things were in place. So hopefully you've got there. Anyway, here they are. Um, the first is capability. Okay? If you don't have the psychological capability, that's the skills and the knowledge and the physical capability, the behaviour won't happen. You can have all the capability in the world, but if you don't also have the opportunity, uh, both the, the physical and the social environment affording opportunity, the behaviour won't happen. You can have all the capability, the opportunity in the environment may, may be ex absolutely right uh, for that behaviour to occur. Why doesn't it occur? Because the third element, motivation, is not in place. And you see here I've talked about reflective and automatic mechanisms that activate or inhibit behaviour. So the reflective is what I'm calling here the mind, the more e evolutionary advanced, our rational decision-making, our conscious choices, weighing up pros and cons. And the automatic mechanisms are much more the emotions, the desires, the impulses. And you'll see here that there are black arrows linking all these two. So this is a system. And if you want to change behaviour, um, you can enter that system at any point because it will have knock-on effects. So, for example, if you know that motivation is low, um, but you're not quite sure how to increase it, you can um, intervene through increasing capability and opportunity. And those will have knock-on effects on motivation. And as behaviour begins to change, so that will then have uh, knock-on effects too. OK, so motivation. I'm going to say a little bit about motivation. This is a battle all the time between the head and the heart. Uh, so there's our top-down, evolutionary advanced part of our brain telling us what to do. Our odds, our plans, our intentions. <coughs> the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Because the other side, the bottom-up, ancient bit of our brain is resisting that often. Our emotions, our desires, our impulses, our habits. So what we often do in terms of behaviour change is try and identify these and bring these into alignment rather than competing against each other. OK, so here's just an illustration of some car adverts. OK, what are they appealing to? OK, here's the head. That's just telling you how much this car is costing. OK? But that's not a very frequent advert. I had to look a long time to find that advert. Really easy to find these kind of adverts. I am striking, agile, thrilling, beautiful, I'm here, etc. Picks up five times more women than a Lamborghini, or however you pronounce it. Separates the men from the boys. This isn't, this isn't uh, appealing to that reflective uh, part of your brain. OK, um, so the problems are when the head and the heart work against each other. And um, what we need to do is to get the head to override the heart. So a very useful theory of motivation, prime theory, uh, looks at uh, capability and motivation. So here we have a very simple diagram of it. If you look at the top left-hand corner and you see those plans, the intentions, for those to actually change your behaviour, it's not enough just to have that plan and intention. Look at how it has to work through our evaluations, i.e. our beliefs. We actually need to believe things if that plan's going to get anywhere. And that's not enough. 
the beliefs, the beliefs can't just be cold, rational beliefs. They have to be underpinned by motives, our wants, our needs. And these have to translate into impulses, urges, desires, etc., in order to actually get through to responses. And this is something that people often don't realise. They operate at the level of plans and beliefs. If people know what's good for them, and if they plan to do it, ergo, behaviour will change. It ain't so. And this is one of the explanations why it isn't. And one of the issues, I talked about behaviour being uh, in context, it's also in the moment. At any one moment, there are many choices. So, Friday evening, shall I lie here, watch TV, drink wine, eat popcorn? <laughs> Battle of impulses and inhibitions in the moment. I think we've all been there or somewhere uh, like that, and probably quite regularly. So, do we put the popcorn out of reach? Do we put the TV off? Do what we said we'd do and go down to the gym? Right, well, we've got a plan. My plan is not to drink in the week, or my plan is I intend to go to the gym tonight. And here I'm showing how it has to work down uh, the system in order to influence behaviour. It's got to be underpinned by beliefs. I know I drink more than is good for me. I feel better when I've done exercise. That has to be underpinned by the wants and needs. I want to make up in the morning feeling fresh. I need to avoid putting on any more weight. So these are positives you're wanting to achieve or negatives you're wanting to avoid. And you're feeling this at an emotional level. Um, so if it goes all the way through to this, it then has a chance of the um, good impulses overriding the inhibitions or the other way around depending on whether one's trying to increase the behaviour or decrease the behaviour. Okay, now I'll say a little bit about opportunity. Um, changing opportunity or, or the social and physical environment is really important in terms of behaviour change. It's not just what goes on between the ears. Um, so here's something about a, a community intervention to change behaviour. This was actually my son, who's an artist, who was commissioned by somebody who had an alleyway. This is just a flat wall with a lot of dumping going on. And so he painted this, and it's been clear ever since. A small little environmental intervention. The big interventions, obviously, are by organisations and by government. Uh, so things like changing the availability of healthy versus uh, junk food in all the environments we're in, uh, regulating the food and drinks industry, so things like food labelling and advertising, um, price structures, so healthy food is cheap, and junk food is expensive. I mean, these are the big hitters uh, in terms of interventions to change behaviour. And um, I think one does need to be wary sometimes of the choice ag agenda. You know, it's all about giving people choices. We're in a society where it's not a level playing field. So in terms of uh, trying not to put on weight, we're living in an obesogenic environment. It's a bit like running up um, an escalator that's going down. So we do need to not just look at individual choice, but absolutely cru crucial, look at the social and material environment we live in and you know, the political context uh, we're working within. Uh, here's in terms of encouraging physical activity things that could be done nationally, selling off, stop selling off playing fields, increasing cheap or free sports facilities, spatial planning of neighbourhoods and buildings. I don't know if you recognise this uh, photograph at the bottom. It's at uh, UCLH, lovely hospital. Outpatients is on the first floor. Can you find a way of walking upstairs to get to the first floor? No. And most people can walk upstairs to get to the first floor. The stairs are tiny and they're tucked behind and really difficult to find, whereas the lifts are right there and often buildings are built like this. So I want to move on to something about intervening. How do we intervene? So I've said something about how to think about behaviour uh, by identifying what it needs to change, what needs to change in terms of is it capability, is it motivation, is it um, the environment, opportunity. That's a starting point. Um, but you then need to move on to, okay, what kind of things can we do uh, within this context to change behaviour? So I don't know if you've heard of NICE, the National Institute for uh, Social and Healthcare Excellence. Um, it provides evidence-based guidance for uh, the NHS and health and social care more generally. And um, it identified some evidence-based principles, and, and these are them. I've put them under capability, opportunity, and motivation. So maximising capability to regulate our own behaviour, so skills like goal-setting, monitoring, feedback developing specific plans to change, 
maximizing opportunity, so drawing on things like social support, um, avoiding social and other cues for current behavior or actually changing those cues in the environment and changing one's own routines and environment. Motivation, uh, rewarding change. Now, the use of rewards, incredibly important driver of uh, behavior. And I would say this is a, a behavior change intervention that we do not use enough, whether it's by organizations for their staff, whether it's for ourselves with our own relationships and family. Reward goes such a long way, really effective. Find things uh, that you want to increase and reward them. I used to do uh, management training when I worked at the Royal Free, and um, one of the things I used to ask senior managers was, when was the last time you called somebody into your office to say, I just wanted to tell you how well you'd done that? And there was always a nervous laughter um, because it didn't really happen. And one of the uh, targets I used to set them, every time you criticize or say something negative about somebody's behavior, just try and get a ratio of three to one positives. Really difficult to do. Try it. Um, OK, so reward, then developing appropriate beliefs, like the benefits of changing other people's approval, uh, relevance to yourself. Your confidence to change is huge. A lot of evidence that actually changing confidence makes a big difference in terms of behavior. And then this issue about de developing positive feelings, not just the head, but the feeling it too. And then obviously, um, reducing motivation to continue with undesired behavior. OK, I'm just going to quickly talk about uh, a literature review where we synthesized evidence about what works for increasing physical activity and healthy eating. Uh, so we looked at a very wide range of interventions and we analysed them using a taxonomy of uh, 26 behaviour change techniques. So what exactly were in these interventions? Because they tend to be very multifaceted and complex. And so we also drew on um, behavioural theory to try and understand what was going on. And this work um, was done as a result of the Department of Health, who I've done a lot of consultancy work, um, saying, are the kind of interventions that are helpful for managing people, uh, or self-management interventions for people with long-term conditions, also helpful in terms of preventing ill health amongst the general population? Went away, looked at the literature. The interventions were so diverse, I didn't quite know how to put them together. And usually what happens is when you synthesize the evidence, you end up with just a very uh, generic, bland statement saying, um, well, there's a lot of heterogeneity, i.e. variance, going on, um, and there's small to medium effects, but it doesn't give you any idea about actually what to do. So this is why we began uh, developing this method for identifying specific behavior change techniques, and I'll show you what happened with this review. Um, the interventions had average of six techniques, so anything from just one to some of them had 14 different techniques going on, combined in many different ways. And very uh, kind of low to middling effect and very, uh, very heterogeneous. But what we noticed by looking at the specific techniques and using a statistical method called meta-regression was one of these, that is self-monitoring, had a significant significant effect for both behaviours across all these diverse interventions. So it's a really strong signal. <coughs> and then what we did was we used theory to think about, OK, sorry, BCTs, that should mean behaviour change techniques here, uh, which combinations are likely to work effectively with self-monitoring to make for an effective intervention. And uh, we use this. This is a very simple um, uh, schematic representation of uh, self-regulation, or what's sometimes called control theory. Um, where we have our goal, we have our target, and actually we're doing this all the, all the time when we're uh, functioning and, and behaving in the way we want to. We're comparing our behaviour with the standard. Um, if we notice a discrepancy, we then act to reduce it. So it's a bit like a, a, a thermostat on a central heating system. Um, one's continually monitoring and adapting and trying to keep one's behaviour within uh, acceptable limits. Uh, so, for example, if I notice you all falling asleep or walking out of this lecture theatre, I might change what I do. Um, so, an example, but don't get, don't get the wrong idea and do that. OK, so what we did was take self-monitoring with one or more of the techniques that would be predicted to work synergistically in that model. So, setting goals, reviewing goals, feedback on performance, and specifying action plans. And what we did is compare the 28 intervention, interventions that included those uh, with the 56 that didn't. 
and we found the ones that included them were twice as effective. So this, is, this D is a measure of effect size, so a whopping great effect size for these interventions. So we were then able to say to the Department of Health, here are some techniques that we can, um, we've demonstrated will be effective if you use them um, in your interventions. And that's been replicated uh, with literature with completely different uh, populations. Okay, so I now want to talk a little bit about how behaviours relate to each other. Um, so they're not standalone. So here we have somebody um, who's obviously struggling in terms of trying to eat more healthily. And you can see, top right hand, they want to buy healthy food in the work canteen. That needs to have the opportunity. It needs to be there. It needs to be provided by people. Um, do they buy fruit and veg or buy high-calorie ready meals? Well, another person may be doing the, the, the shopping for them. Do they eat crisps or chocolate, prepare healthy food at home? Another person may be doing the cooking. So the point I'm making here is that all our behaviours are not only part of a network of other behaviours in ourselves as individuals, but also are very interdependent on a lot of other people's behaviours. And if we want to uh, efficiently and effectively change these, we have to, for each behaviour, who needs to do what, when, where and how. Be very specific about what we're targeting. Changing behaviour also um, requires understanding. I talked about the whole uh, context, and here's a very iconic public health diagram. Now, um, NICE guidance I mentioned before uh, found that the most effective interventions are those that intervene at many levels simultaneously and consistently. So at the individual level, the community level, and the population level. And sometimes he you hear people pitting one versus the other. And um, I think this very neatly shows, and the evidence very neatly shows, that actually one needs to think about systems as a whole and be intervening uh, with that, within the context of those systems. Now, this is the, the question that people have. What strategies are likely to be effective for changing what behaviours for which people in which situations? So in order to um, answer that question, we need to consider all the options. Often what happens is people jump in very quickly um, with, well, let's try this or let's try that. And when I say people, I mean everybody, from researchers to policymakers to other intervention designers. Um, a colleague of mine who's now retired uh, talked about people using the Islagiat principle, and probably never of you, all of you have never heard of Islagiat principle. Well, it stands for the first letters of the words, it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> and sadly, uh, that's what happens. So um, I think it's very useful to use uh, frameworks, um, good frameworks. Ones, by that I mean ones that are co comprehensive, so we don't miss out options coherent, so you have a systematic method for intervention design, and linked to a model of behaviour, such as the one I showed you, so you can draw on behavioural science. And also, that's usable by and useful to policy makers, service planners, and intervention designers. This next bit of work, again, was stimulated by work with the Department of Health, where people were often bringing frameworks, what do you think of this, what do you think of that? And they were good and bad in different ways, but none of them met these three criteria. So I thought, well, let's look at the literature. Let's see what's out there. So we reviewed the literature, identified 19 frameworks related to health, environment, culture change, social marketing, etc. cetera. Um, none met all the, those criteria, but there was a huge amount of overlap. And so what we did, we synthesized them in terms of a framework that I'm calling the behavior change wheel, which I shall uh, present. Now, if anybody's interested in reading more about this, this is an open access journal. So if you Google behavior change wheel, uh, you'll find it. And you'll find in the supplementary files at the end, the frameworks that uh, we drew on and the steps we took um, to synthesize these. And there were two main levels. So what we called intervention functions and policy categories. You see, we've got the combi model put in the center of the wheel, because the idea is, if you want to change behavior, you absolutely have to start here. You have to make a behavioral diagnosis of your behavior in context. Do you remember what it is that needs to change? Which aspects of opportunity, capability, and, and motivation? Because they will direct you to which of the following uh, nine intervention functions that I'm going to show you. Um, in the article, there are matrices which show how to map from one to the other. So here are nine uh, intervention functions. 
we have education, persuasion, incentivization, coercion, training, enablement, modeling, by this I mean role modeling, environmental restructuring, and restrictions. And all of those 19 frameworks, in terms of direct interventions, fitted into one or more of these nine intervention functions. Round the outside, we've got policies, because in order for any of this to be maintained over time, one needs these kind of decisions by authorities, the, the broader <coughs> policies. And so we identified seven of these. Um, environmental or social planning, communication and marketing, legislation, service provision, regulation, fiscal measures, which is taxation, and uh, guidelines such as those that uh, NICE produce. Okay, so um, this framework has been used in many different ways. We actually um, developed it in order to have a systematic, theoretically based way of designing interventions. Um, it's been taken up across many different government departments, and actually what they're now doing is what I'm calling retrofitting, using this framework to identify what's in their current interventions and policies. What's, what's missing here? If things are missing, is that for a good reason? Because actually the evidence shows in our situation it's not appropriate, or possibly it's not politically acceptable, or is it we just never thought about it? So they're finding it very, very useful for this. Also a framework for evaluation. It's not just enough to show that interventions are effective. We absolutely need to understand how they're effective. What are their mechanisms of action? Um, because then we're in a position to be able to improve interventions for the future. So, for instance, these intervention functions are very useful to think, OK, well, which intervention functions did a successful um, uh, intervention work through? And also it's been used, uh, again, by NICE and others for structuring uh, systematic reviews, which brings the research evidence uh, together across many different disparate studies. Here are some of the... Um, countries it's been used in, and some of you can see, uh, I won't uh, read them all, but uh, very different types of um, health condition, um, and even here one promoting recycling behaviours in university staff and students. This was done um, collaboratively here at, at UCL. Okay, I've um, gone through this quite quickly. If anybody wants to look in more detail, um, we produced a, a book because we were being asked to provide so many training workshops that my small team weren't able to deliver it. So uh, we've, we've developed this, uh, which is a very step-by-step -step guide with lots of um, case, case examples. And if people are interested, I'll um, finish where I started off uh, by saying uh, do go on the um, website of the Centre for Behaviour Change where we have a lot of different uh, resources um, and we post events, etc., up there. So I hope that gives time for a questions discussion, because in my experience, that's always the most interesting bit of any talk. Um, but Richard, you can say how much time we have left. Uh, Thank you. Looks like we've got. Thank you very much. <laughs> so we've got about 10, 10, 10 to 12 minutes of time for questions, if people have got questions or short points they'd like to I would like your thoughts on the links between, or if there is any links, do you think, between expectation and behaviour is one thing that wasn't actually raised. Okay, so ex expectation was, was tucked in there under the, if you remember, the principles that I talked about uh, with the beliefs, and expectations um, can be of two main kinds. There's expectations about the consequences, so the expectations, if I do this then what will happen? So that's a very important belief uh, that, that is um, very influential on behaviour. And the other um, very key bit of expectation is expectation of myself. Expectation, will I be able to do this? Uh, which is sometimes, in, in psychology jargon, it's often called self-efficacy. But it's a kind of self-confidence, a belief in self. Um, it was the one that I said was the one that really has a lot of evidence um, that it predicts um, behaviour. Yeah. Sorry, I meant really in terms of this expectation in behaviour that we 
expect of ourselves before we actually go into the event and in many ways answering why or dealing with the situation why your manager perhaps doesn't always compliment you because frankly that's behavior that's expected of you yeah um so are you are you talking about socially expected behaviors yeah okay so get psychology jargon talks about uh, normative influences um hugely hugely important um i mean one of the things at a population level i've been amazed by in terms of behavior change and i don't know if, if others have too has been people picking up dog poo in parks you know 10 years ago uh, this was a kind of minority activity. And now, exactly for the reason um, you're pointing out, the influence of other people, um, you know, people who don't do that now, uh, the real minority. And this has been a huge, big shift in, in behaviour. Um, another study I did, which illustrates your point well, is it was around the time of pandemic flu, and we were looking to see what kind of messages uh, would have most impact on washing hands with soap, which is soap is absolutely needed to uh, get rid of germs. And so what we did is we wired up uh, motorway toilets, which has you know, thousands and thousands of people coming through every hour, and also the soap dispenser. So we knew the ratio of people uh, that were coming into the toilets and um, compared to the number of times the soap dispenser was used. And then we had a LED display and 24-7 um, had lots of different kinds of messages we're trialing. But one of the interesting things that we found out from that study uh, was that there was a direct correlation between the number of people in the toilet at any one time and the frequency of um, uh, using the soap. So if you thought you were being watched by other people, you were more likely to. There's also a big gender difference, and I don't think I have to spell out in what way the gender difference was. <laughs> Has there been much research in how behaviours change if the intervention isn't continuously applied? So say some intervention has been given and behaviours have shifted, if that suddenly is assumed to have worked and eventually the policy is sort of left alone, do people revert back to their normative behavior or do like what's the retentiveness of the behavioral change if these interventions are suddenly uh, stopped, for example? Excellent question, because if behavior change is going to make any difference to all those social problems I talked about at the beginning, in, including health, it absolutely has to be maintained. And um, we do know about the principles that are likely to keep um, behaviour being maintained, um, but often they're not applied. And I talked about, you know, the, the choice sort of agenda and the kind of beliefs being quite limited. I mean, it's very important, but it's limited. The things we need to sustain behaviour change are environmental change um, and also developing routines and habits. Um, and we could have a whole other lecture about these two things. Um, but we really need to pay more attention to this. Sadly, um, the evidence is so much uh, more sparse because if you think about the cost of funding research products that looks at maintenance, we're talking about you know, five, ten years. Um, and so there's much less on, on that, even though it's so important. But having said that, the principles are pretty clear um, and they do need to be used more. Um, well, due to trying to achieve behavior change has to be evidence-based or theory-based, and then you depict the techniques that you use to enhance that behavior change. But sometimes the theory behind it has overlapping constructs and overlapping techniques with other frameworks. What's the state of that uh, research? Okay, um, so in terms of the techniques, um, we've now, uh, we've developed a lot of different taxonomies for techniques in different domains, so smoking, alcohol, etc. And then I realised what was happening was we were fragmenting, whereas what I wanted to do is bring the whole scientific community to use the same language. So the Medical Research Council funded a, a grant, a um, three-year grant, and we had altogether about 400 people from all over the world contributing. And uh, last year, we published the result of it, which was a taxonomy of 93 behavior change techniques. And these are all very well specified and defined and distinct from each other. And this methodology is being taken up 
all over the world. So it's having a really good effect. And we're now doing more research, building on that, actually linking to theory. Now, the book at the top left-hand corner that I haven't had time to talk about, um, again, this uh, was the result of a, a three-year project uh, funded by the Medical Research Council looking at theories of behaviour change. Um, now, theories are ways of representing the world and uh, looking at relationships between different um, constructs. Um, and they're very helpful in terms of guiding research and guiding interventions. And what we identified here, even using quite narrow search criteria, was 83 different theories of behaviour change. Again, many were overlapping. And this isn't useful. This isn't useful to the field because people do want to draw on psychological theory. The best theory represents what we know about any uh, domain at a time. Um, but they don't know where to start. How do we select it? How do we apply it? So quite a lot of my work's been in that area, and we're currently working actually with computer scientists uh, to make sense of, I think it's 1,700 plus constructs in these 83 theories with so many different relationships, many not properly specified. So we're now specifying them and looking at the overlap with a view to bringing um, some prototype theories that are really bringing the best of everything together. Uh, which I think will be a lot, a lot more helpful. So watch this space on that one. Um, do you think it would help if the law was implemented? Because I think there are a lot of people who won't change their behaviour if they know they can break the law with impunity. Well, we have a lawyer here who can uh, probably <laughs> give his view. Uh, the law is a very helpful um, aspect, but it's only one aspect. And one absolutely has to have uh, the public along with one. If one's creating laws that are deeply unpopular, it's unlikely to be successful. So if one looks at um, two, probably of the most effective behaviour change interventions in this country in our um, lifetimes, one has been seatbelts. And that wasn't just about legislation. There was a huge campaign to win hearts and minds. Um, so not only you know, giving statistics about um, how many fewer people would die if we wore seatbelts, but also quite vivid, emotionally engaging um, advertising. So the two going hand in hand was very helpful. Um, the other is, what's the other really big successful behavior change in this country? Smoking cessation, yeah. Um, and again, there was real concern about the, the legislation um, for having um, smoke-free public areas. Um, quite a bit of work was done. Um, but what's happened there is actually smokers, there was evidence that even smokers were welcoming it. They would like it. So that was an, an example, again, where the legislation was seen as facilitative because smokers, most smokers don't want to carry on smoking. It's very difficult to stop. Again, we could have a whole lecture just on that subject. So I think the law, and if you look at the behaviour change wheel, it's one tool amongst many that can be used. And one really does have to um, look at the behaviour in the context, the particular culture, um, to understand what it's, what it's about before deciding which of the interventions are likely to be effective and how to um, use them together for maximum effect. Um, I, was <clears throat> I was thinking particularly of female genital mutilation. And I really don't think you can have one law for one group of people and another law. Sorry, I missed that. You can't. I don't think you can have one law for one group of people and another law for another group of people in the same state. Yeah. Well, I think that's a, a really good issue. Um, but it's a huge issue. And if we had another hour, Richard, I think we could do a joint uh, seminar on that one. But um, come and talk to us afterwards, because that is a big issue. I think we're going to have to wrap it up there, because we're just about out of time. I know one or two others wanted to come in. Um, so sorry about that. Um, just remains for us to thank you for attending for some really very interesting questions, indeed. And also particularly to thanks, Susan, for a fascinating uh, lecture this lunchtime. Thank you very much. Okay.